Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Counterfactual Gaming, the gaming channel where if there's something historical to do in a video game, we don't do it. Now, before we get started, I'd just like to ask you, if you like what you see, go ahead and throw a like and a sub on the video and the channel. But if you've got any questions about the game or the historical circumstances of what we're doing, drop a comment down below and I'll be sure and get back to you. I may not have a good answer for you, but I'll have an answer for you. Now, for the past six months, I've opened my videos by talking about how here at Counterfactual Gaming, we don't actually do the historical thing. But today is going to be very special, because today we're going to do something historical that is also not historical. And I'm going to do this historical thing that's not historical by using actual historical research and scholarly articles, some of which I will put into the description for the video in case you want to take a look at it yourself. Now, what do I mean by something that's historical but not historical? Well, today I'm here to show you that in Hearts of Iron 4, you can build the Navy Stalin historically wanted to build in the 1930s and the 1940s. Now, you don't have to be an expert in the history of the Soviet Union to know that the Soviet Union didn't really have much of a navy in the 1930s and 1940s. But as we're going to see in a little bit, Stalin had a plan for building a navy. And I don't just mean like a navy, like like a, an Italian-sized navy or, or maybe a, a French-sized navy. No, 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 no. Stalin's naval plan would have built a navy that rivaled Japan, Britain, and even the historical constructions of the U.S. Navy during the actual war. So what we're going to do today is I'm going to have to give you a little bit of historical context for what I'm doing before I actually do it. Show you what Stalin's different naval plans were, talk about how he intended to implement those, and then see if I can do that in actual Hearts of Iron. Now, before I get started with this discussion of Stalin's naval build plan, I need to point out that I, I've only used English language sources for this. So if any of you are knowledgeable of Russian and you think that my research is inadequate, just keep in mind I don't read Russian, so there's an entire set of scholarship and archives that I simply can't look at. I can only do research in English. What we're looking at here isn't anything super complicated in terms of translation or archival work. Um, it's, it's, most of this is, for lack of a better term, like open source information. None of this is like super secret or anything. It just doesn't get talked about a lot because during the war, the Soviets didn't focus on the Navy very much for reasons that were obvious. So what are we talking about with Stalin's naval build plan? Well, first we need to talk about how bad the Soviet Navy was in 1936, which is the year that Hearts of Iron IV starts, but it is also the first year where Stalin and the people involved with running the Soviet Navy started coming up with ideas on creating a new naval force. And while Hearts of Iron does not cover all of the ship types in a real Navy, in terms of ships that Hearts of Iron 4 cares about, the Soviet Navy was garbage. And it wasn't garbage because the Soviets just don't know anything about ships. It was garbage because the Civil War had ruined most of the potential Soviet Union's shipbuilding industry. There had also been a focus on other aspects of the Soviet Union's economy to the detriment of the Navy. And until you get into the 1930s, there wasn't much of a need for a Soviet Navy in the view of a lot of thinkers. There's also one other little wrinkle to this, is that when the revolution was successful, a lot of people were promoted to positions of naval authority who had been, before the revolution, like enlisted non-commissioned officers or uh, political folks aligned with the Communist Party. And so there were a lot of questions even in the leadership of the Soviet Union on what should a Navy do, how should a Navy be formed, and that sort of thing. And so Soviet leadership came up with a series of naval plans to create a world-class Navy. 
Now, I, I want to explain the numbers that you're seeing on this table here, because I took these this table from the article listed below. It's a really good article. I will have it linked in the description. But let me explain these numbers, and then you'll understand what these naval plans are. Each of the listings that you're seeing here, the June 36 plan, the May 37 plan, and so on, each of these is a separate, different plan for building a world-class Navy. They're all changes to one another. The June 36 plan is the first one, and then as time goes on, Soviet leadership refines and changes that plan. And all of these naval plans assumed that the Soviet Union would complete this construction by 1947. So basically, any one of these naval plans you're seeing up here is a roughly a 10-year construction plan for a Navy. Now, I, I want you to understand just what you're seeing here. That's 24 battleships, plus all those other ships, built by 1947 by a country that hasn't built a battleship since before World War I, and specifically before the Revolution. Those of you familiar with the U.S. Navy's evolution from the 30s and 40s will no doubt be thinking that this is even more ambitious than the two-ocean naval plan passed by Congress in 1940, but the U.S. was a strong naval power that had a long tradition of building big capital ships from well before the 1930s. And that was a less ambitious plan than the one Stalin and his naval thinkers were proposing here. Now, as you see, the naval plan changes over time. And, and I want to make something clear. Is by the time we get to 1940 and onward, you'll see that the plan changes and gets weaker because more resources were devoted to the Red Army as the Soviet Union got closer to war. While the Soviet Union was not necessarily fully prepared for a war in June of 1941, Soviet leadership did recognize that uh, because of what was happening in the world, they needed a stronger army sooner than they needed a stronger navy. So some of those numbers change. But also some of these numbers change because Stalin himself revised the plan a couple of times. Uh, the article from where I got this mentions that Stalin really liked his battle cruisers, and so he eventually had the first three plans kind of modified so that they could scrap some of the battleships and instead turn them into battle cruisers and then get rid of the heavy cruisers altogether. Whether that's a good idea or not is a subject I don't intend to get into right now because the whole idea of battleships versus battle cruisers is way beyond the scope of what I want to talk about today. But for our purposes, what we have here is a naval plan that is so ambitious its combined tonnage, especially here, the June of 1936 uh, production plan, was more than what the U.S. actually produced during the war, okay? That's how much shipbuilding. And the Soviet Union was starting with a shipbuilding industry that is garbage. Hearts of Iron Four actually gives the Soviets a better shipbuilding industry than they probably really had historically. They have all kinds of advantages. But I also want you to understand what we mean by battleships here. These battleships were the Project 23 battleships, the Sovetsky Soyuz class, which as you can see here from the data I've posted would have been around 59,000 tons. This puts these battleships in the same category as the uh, BB-67-4 designs that the US were going to use for the Montana class which had a displacement of 63 tons, and of course, everyone's favorite ridiculous battleship, the Yamada, which would have weighed around 69,000 tons. The Project 23 ships were a little bit lighter than Yamato and Montana, mainly because their armament would not have been as big, but on paper, at least, they would have had like comparable armor comparable machinery, comparable engines, and that sort of thing. Now, before we go too much further, I do want to point out that not just Soviet shipbuilding, but Soviet metalworking probably wouldn't have been up to the task to actually do the real armor schemes on these battleships. But on paper, the Project 23 battleships were basically what Hearts of Iron IV would call super heavy battleships. 
maybe not gunned as well as Yamato was, but would have been super heavy battleships. So what we're talking about here then is a Soviet Union that's going to propose building 24 super heavy battleships on top of destroyers and cruisers and light cruisers and submarines and all that other stuff. It's like an insane build plan. And, and I want to just remind everyone just how insane this build plan is. The Two Ocean Navy Act uh, passed by the U.S. Congress in July of 1940 only authorized eight Essex-class aircraft carriers, two Iowas, five Montanas, and six Alaska-class large cruisers. Nowhere near 24 super heavy battleships. Like, it's, it's just absurd. It's just ridiculous. Now, so while there's several different plans to choose from in order to build a Soviet Navy, I'm going to choose the 1936 plan because I think it would be harder than some of the others. While the battle cruiser plans do drop the heavy cruisers uh, and build battle cruisers, I think that the t just a flat out 24 super heavy battleships will make this plan the harder of the various plans to achieve. So that's the one I'm going to be doing. I'm also going to be, of course, fighting the war, so I do need to have an army and try to do things. Uh, and as I'm going to show you in a minute, though, uh, the Soviet Union actually has a lot of useful focuses for building a fleet and a navy. And, well, I wouldn't recommend it in any sort of normal gameplay. There's no reason in the world you can't actually have a Soviet fleet that's worth a damn. The question is, what are you willing to sacrifice to do it? And as I found out when I ran this challenge a couple of times, because I did this about four times before I, I actually sat down and started editing and making this video, uh, the choices you make in how you build a fleet have an economic impact on the rest of everything else. But we'll talk about that in a minute. Now, when I'm talking about uh, special things that the Soviets get in order to make it easier for them to build the Navy, I want to highlight a few things. Uh, the first of all is there's an option when you take this designer to ask for help with naval construction. And if you fire that decision, that's a 10% boost to dockyard construction speed. That's not that's the least important bonus. If we go over here to the Red Fleet, when you take the proper focuses, you end up with a 10% discount on capital ship and screen costs. Now, it also has a refitting cost reduction as well, which I am gonna make extensive use of for reasons that I'll go into in a little bit. And if we go over here to the Sevastopol Marine Plant, you can also see that it has discounts on ships, including another 5% to capital ship costs. Which means that you can easily stack a 15% reduction to capital ships in terms of their production cost. And then if you're doing something like, say, running the naval production focus, that's going to improve dockyard output. Uh, we have a lot of things that can just boost Soviet productivity in naval matters. But that's not all. If we go over here to the expand the Red Fleet tree, there are a lot of free dockyards here. And I, I, it had been a while since I'd even looked at this, and I had forgotten before I started this project just how many free dockyards the Soviets can get. It, this is These focuses are almost as good as Tankograd. Okay, so we get two here. Then we're going to get uh, a dockyard here. We're going to get no dockyard here. No dockyard here. No dockyard here, but we're going to get a dockyard for every place we've expanded our naval bases, which is going to be 11, which is, so that's going to be when I executed this, and I, of course, executed after I reinforced all of the naval bases, that's 11 dockyards plus those two which is 13 dockyards for free from these focuses. On top of all of that, we have focuses that provide bonuses for ships, bonus for destroyers, 
Bonus to heavy cruiser and light cruiser models. Bonus to super heavy battleship, which is I don't even use. I don't even use that bonus because I'd already researched and started building super heavies before I even got to that focus. Um, so, like, the Soviet Union has a ton of naval focuses. And just to remind everyone, Tankograd might be able to give you 8 to 10 factories when you do Tankograd. This gives you even more dockyards, and dockyards are harder to do than factories are. You can put factories anywhere. Dockyards, you can't put just anywhere. You can only put those on the coast. Now, as I said earlier, I ran this challenge a couple of times. And what I learned is that how you build things and the order in which you do them can kind of change the way you play the game. Uh, the first time I did this, I did naval production focus much sooner and I ran all of these naval focuses much earlier and I was able to meet my goal super quickly, no problem. But by it took me to much longer to actually defeat Germany and the Axis because I had, I had really terrible army debuffs and my army production was pretty bad. There was a point where I had more Nick than I had MIC. This game, the one I've got here for save purposes, I instituted the naval production focus much later. I did these focuses a little later. And I discovered I didn't bother taking any of these focuses because I realized that it wasn't helping me too much, but I did make sure that I had advisors and ministers and all the effort I needed put into doctrine so I could do what I needed to do there. And I was able to defeat Germany much faster by building more MIC than Nick and making sure I had like the right military assets in place. Uh, however, this game that we're looking at right now, you'll notice that I'm, I'm at war yeah, I'm not at war with the Axis powers. I'm going to show you how I ended up at war with the Allies a little bit later. I started my actual naval research in 1937. I would kind of gotten the ducks in a row that I wanted. And instead of waiting for focuses to give me boosts to capital ship research, I manually researched the 1936 heavy hull and went straight into the super heavy battleship hull. Tied up a, a, a research slot for a long time but it meant I didn't have to wait for research boosts to get that done. Also, one of the things that I realized that was really easy for me to do as the Soviet Union, unless I've got a lot of ships here just exercising, constantly exercising. And that's because even though I have intervention going on in the Spanish Civil War, uh, the Soviet Union has plenty of fuel so I can exercise all the air wings I want to exercise until the planes are all dead or I send those planes to China and I can just constantly generate naval XP from naval exercises which means that once I've generated enough naval XP I can fill all that out as necessary. I also considered appointing a head of the Navy but I realized that I could just generate all the naval XP I needed from exercising crappy old ships so like why waste the political power doing that? Now, with research completed, by 1938, I was kind of ready to start building super heavy battleships. I wanted to go ahead and lay some keels and get them started. Uh, but there's a problem. Let me see if you can see what the problem is. You see, I've got the hull unlocked. Okay, so we're going to put some, I will put some second, crappy secondary batteries on there. I don't have any radar yet. Crappy fire control. Crappy AA gun. Main battery. Uh, we don't have a main battery option to choose from. That's a problem. And the reason we don't have a main battery option to choose from is because even with the super heavy battleship technology unlocked, which does, un technically, it's supposed to unlock, if we look at this, it sh should unlock the tier five guns. It doesn't actually do that. What it actually does is it unlocks a super heavy hull, but the tier five guns that go on the super heavy battleship are not unlocked until you research this tech right here. This tech 
gives you tier two battleship batteries, but also gives you the tier five guns that can only go on the super heavy battleship. And so I hadn't factored that into my thinking. I was like, oh no, I gotta spend another 82 days doing that research. It didn't cost me much, but if you're thinking about doing super heavy battleships yourself for any country, when they start with really bad naval tech, you need to make sure you get the hull, but you also need to get the basic heavy battery research so you can unlock that. Otherwise, you literally can't put main batteries on a super heavy battleship and you can't start building it. So let's take a look at the situation on the day Barbarossa starts. The Germans are attacking, as you can see here. They're not doing a very good job of it because for some reason they're not pushing out from Romania. Also, don't ask why this defense is set up like this with a big weird gap in it. Uh, just accept that my defense plan is very weird and not necessarily super optimized. But I do want to talk about this defense plan before looking at the Navy for just one second. Normally, I would never defend right up here on the border with the Axis. I always prefer to defend the river line with uh, Kiev being the only tile I care about on the other side of the major river line because this is the best place to defend. It forces the Axis powers to try to drive through the marshes. It gives me time to do things like scorched earth. Uh, it forces the Germans and the Romanians to attack across rivers, except at the Vitebsk Gap, which of course you reinforce with extra stuff. It also means that uh, as they push into Ukraine, there's an issue with airfields where it will be easier for the Soviets to crowd the air region with air power than it is for the Axis as they push forward. But I don't have an option for that in this game because I need the Nick on the coast and I have to have all these coastal tiles because this is where the Nick is. I gotta control all this, so I can't really give this stuff up. Yeah, I know some of the stuff in the Baltic doesn't necessarily have Nick, but as time goes on, and you saw this in the 1947 save, when I unlock extra slots from technology, these little coastal areas open up a few extra slots, which let me put in extra nick. So I need to fight the Germans right at the border. That is not the way I want to do it. And I've also have a setup where I have 60 nick currently working in 1941, and you can tell I don't have enough tank destroyers. Uh, you can tell I don't have enough airplanes. Like, I really should have a lot more MIC cranking out planes and tanks to defeat the Germans. And I just don't have it. So I'm fighting under less than optimal conditions. But we're not here to win the war on land, other than to just make sure I don't lose. We're here to instead take a look at what the Navy is doing. Um, as you can tell, I've been building some destroyers. I have a few of the older Leningrad Minsks, but I've upgraded to Leningrad Minsk Class B. Uh, these older Leningrad Minsk Class destroyers will get refit at a certain point. I've built three Kirovs, and I've built five Talon light cruisers. I'll show you what those look like in just a second. Uh, I've got 53 Series XX subs and 49 Series XXAs. Don't worry about the rest of these. These are all crap subs, but I've got a decent number of subs already built. None of the Super Heavy Battleships have completed yet. I still only have the Marit and, and her sister ships. We're going to take a look at the production screen. We'll just not look at the land stuff because it makes me sad. You can see I've almost completed construction of the first Sovetsky Soyuzes. One will complete in August of 41. I got another one that'll be done in September. I've got a bunch of destroyers that are finishing. I've got a bunch of uh, submarines that are being done. And I did start constru construction of the Talon light cruiser. This is what that looks like. You can tell it's a light cruiser because it reset, it's set to being a screen. I'm using the good old light cruiser battery, which doesn't make this ship super good at engaging other capital ships. But of course, as we all know, that's not what light cruisers really do. Is They're meant to destroy enemy screens. That's what this ship is designed to do, although you can tell I still don't have a lot of good technology for it, and I'm only using Cruiser Armor 1 on it. 
Uh, the Karavs have been upgraded to Karav C with uh, slight changes to the design. Nothing super fancy there. And I've made no changes yet to Savetsky Soyuz. Uh, they will get some upgrades as they complete. Overall, we are on track by 41 to actually meeting our goals. It's August of 1943, and I, and I want you to notice something. Do you notice something weird? Take a look up here. Yeah, that's we went. We got to a peace conference. Uh, this is the aftermath of that peace conference, which resulted in the Soviet Union annexing Germany, Denmark, the Netherlands, uh, Luxembourg, Austria, Hungary, Romania, Albania, parts of Macedonia from Bulgaria. Yeah, we have officially won the war. It was largely a Soviet victory, as you can tell. Uh, the Allies managed to, to take back Italy, and they managed to liberate portions of Yugoslavia, but I took the rest. Now, this is an unanticipated problem, because the other tests I did, Germany didn't capitulate this quickly. They went until 1945, but you see what we got, the, this little problem here. If I can't get my war support up to 80%, I'm going to have to demobilize out of total mobilization, which is going to mess up my civilian factory count. And, spoiler alert, I'm not able to do it in time before a general strike happens, which means I have to yank myself out of total mobilization. This changes the math on everything, because now I have to pay more civilian factories, now I have to worry about a bunch of other things, and... I, if I had been paying better attention to my war support during the war, I would have more consistently fired the decisions to get rid of these debuffs, and I might have actually been able to get uh, enough war support to be able to maintain total mobilization. But that isn't what happened. So uh, I'm a bad player. Don't do what I did. If you think you're going to go to a peace conference, but you still need to build a ton of super heavy battleships, go ahead and do everything you can to get that war support back up. Now, you can see that I'm running this focus right here, and I do run some other political focuses to get that war support up, but it's it's too late. There's no, nothing I can do about it at this point. Also, it's worth noting that because we're at peace now, we have a whole bunch of new propaganda things to run, but what we can't do is we can't run some of the ones that I would like to run, including this every hammer hit of the hammer hits the enemy, uh, that is not going to be able to happen anymore because I'm not at war. This is that war that I was telling you about. It's June of 46 and Turkey declares war on me. I don't know why they're declaring war on me. I, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know why they would even waste the time. We settled a peace conference a long time ago, one that I think the Allies did fairly well on, and I let them annex Iran, and they're still attacking me, which this catches me completely by surprise. Because I was just running the game at full speed, just waiting for things to complete in the queue, and then this happens. And I'm really not prepared for it. It's also not enough war support to get me over the edge to... Uh, get back to total mobilization. But at this point, I probably don't need it. All right. And it's the moment of truth. We uh, we should know that I've already completed it. Just for the record, uh, I did not deploy the Navy to do any fighting uh, because I didn't want to have to do extra math. So I've lost 14 convoys, but no ships. But if we take a look at it, I ended up with 38 super heavy battleships. I built a lot of extra. One Sovetsky Soyuz has not finished refits, but the rest are up to Sovetsky Soyuz B. So they've got the radar, they've got the dual purpose secondaries, all the goodies on them. I've got almost 300 of the advanced series XX subs. I have plenty of cruisers. I've far exceeded my cruiser quota. Uh, and all the cruisers have been upgraded to Karav E and Talon D. Uh, Karav E uh, just added the best radar to it. 
on top of everything else. The earlier Kirovs only had kind of okay radar. And I have plenty of destroyers. As you can see, I, meet the, I met the destroyer quota. And on top of all that, I built three aircraft carriers. Stalin's build plan is perfectly possible in Hearts of Iron 4, even if you're a bad player like me who doesn't know how to manage his economy very well. And it's possible even if you make a mistake and don't defend yourself from an unanticipated attack by the Allies. I mean, look at that. They, they just wandered over there because I didn't even know they were going to declare war on me. This is terrible. I can't believe I let myself get trolled like this. But... We weren't worried about defeating the Allies. We were worried about building a naval build plan. And Stalin's build plan, the 1936 plan, is perfectly feasible in Hearts of Iron IV. I think any of the build plans that we saw are probably feasible. It's, there's no problem getting appropriate carriers into production. And I think you could translate the 38 super heavy battleships that I built into other ship types, including battle cruisers, if you wanted to implement any of the other plans. All right, that about wraps up the game. As you can see, the Allies are slowly going to defeat me as I was completely unprepared for their attack. I can't believe that I let them surround 21 entire divisions in Klagenfurt, but that's the way things are. What can you do? I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope that it provided at least a tiny bit of historical insight in how Hearts of Iron works and how the history of Soviet naval buildups actually function. I'm a little bit surprised that it was actually this easy to meet the requirements of Stalin's build plan, but, you know, that's just the way it is. That's how these things work out. Where I'm living, it's actually sunny for once outside and not raining, so rather than sit here and get myself defeated by the AI, I think I might go out and go do something more fun with my time. I hope you're all having a pleasant day, and I will see you guys later. Have a good one.